good day everyone who uh, is joining us here to hear about the Best Practice Spotlight Organization uh, program in relation to our webinar series on the primary prevention of childhood obesity. As you know, this series um, has uh, commenced to look at uh, implementation of the guideline primary prevention of childhood obesity. This is the second in our obesity series, if you will. We will be having one further webinar on this topic. And uh, as you know, our first topic provided background information and highlights of the guideline second edition of Primary Prevention of Childhood Obesity. I'm Dr. Imogene Bainock. I'm the Director of the International Affairs and Best Practice Guidelines Center. And today we have a series of speakers who have joined me here, and uh, one is joining us uh, offline. Uh, but with me today is Grace Suva, and Grace uh, led the panel for the development of the second edition of the Obesity Guideline, and she will be providing an overview of the guideline. Second is um, Heather McConnell. Heather is the Associate Director of our program here at RNAO, and um, her responsibility really focuses on knowledge translation and the many projects and programs we have in this regard. Heather will talk to us about the implementation strategy, the best practice spotlight organizations. And then we're delighted to have with us Laura Mitchell. And Laura is from the Toronto Public Health Unit. Um, Toronto Public Health uh, Unit is a best practice spotlight organization and uh, was designated in 2012. And we're very delighted uh, to have their involvement today. Laura is a public health nurse in the Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention Directorate and has been keenly involved in the implementation of this guideline. And she'll tell you much more about uh, how they've implemented the guideline at Toronto Public Health. I also um, want to let you know that we do have um, time today. We've reserved 10 minutes for discussion and questions, so we're all going to pay very uh, specific attention to time so that we can have a robust question period. I also want to thank uh, Laura Sykes, who's with us here today and is really managing uh, the system so that uh, you see and hear the presentation and that your questions are captured. I do want to um, also let you know that this webinar is being recorded and um, let you know also that at uh, this time all participants are in listening mode for the presentation portion. And um, at uh, the question period, I ask you to type your questions into the chat box on your screens. Now you can do that uh, at any time during the presentation, but we'll be capturing them at uh, the end. So I want to move into um, the background that uh, I will be presenting. And uh, first, to let you know that the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario is the professional association and the voice of registered nurses in this province in Canada. And we see ourselves as a strong and credible voice, and we've earned that credibility, I would say, um, from nurses, from other healthcare providers, from the public, and from our government and policy decision makers. Our uh, mandate is really promoting healthy public policy and clinical excellence. Clinical excellence um, is very much driven by evidence-based practice, and we see our best practice guidelines program as a signature program of RNAO and really critical to our evidence-based uh, practice and policy work. I've mentioned uh, the agenda already for today, but it's it's up before you. I'm doing the overview. We'll have the highlights of the guideline, 
And then um, a key area to look at is the spotlight organization. And then in our lesson from the field, you'll hear from the spotlight organization and how they've implemented, and I might add, sustained implementation of uh, the primary prevention of childhood obesity guidelines. The, uh, for your information, the International Affairs and the Guidelines Center has as its mandate to implement, um, to develop, uh, help implement, and uh, disseminate in healthy work environment best practice guidelines. And we have been engaged in this work since 1999, and we are funded by the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, for which we are very grateful. I'll move now to just look at the model of our program, and you'll see on the slide four different circles. And I'll start with the top large circle that's labeled guideline development, just to let you know that we have a seven-step process in guideline development that starts with uh, topic selection or topic coming to our attention. Sometimes it comes through recommendations from government committees or task forces. Uh, nurses um, identify this as a critical area. Sometimes it's an area that comes from public uh, confusion, for example, our safe sleep guideline, sometimes from health system issues like our care transitions guideline that uh, is helpful across all our regional uh, health areas in Ontario and, and elsewhere. Our guidelines um, are developed by experts uh, who use evidence that comes from systematic reviews that are conducted by our in-house RNAO research associates who are trained in this work and uh, conduct these reviews, develop uh, tables of data that our panel members then use to develop recommendations in practice, education, and policy. From there, the guideline is put together and sent out to a wide variety of stakeholders. I would uh, uh, suggest that some of you online today may well have been expert panel members or even stakeholder uh, reviewers. Following input from our stakeholders, the guideline is revised and published and disseminated wide, widely. We commit to a five-year review and um, revision in a new guideline, and our obesity guideline is an example of a second edition guideline. From there, you can see we also are very interested in deployment and implementation. These guidelines are not developed to sit around anywhere, but to be actively used. We have a number of um, uh, strategies, approaches, and programs to support guideline use. Uh, one is education for individuals uh, in relation to guideline implementation. Others, <coughs> excuse me, relate to our champion network. We have nursing order sets, communities of practice, and also spotlight organizations. I won't say uh, anything more about the spotlights because that really is an area for focus today. We've also developed and honed our approach to monitoring and evaluation. We link this work to quality improvement. Uh, clearly, we're constantly asking the question, what difference does this make uh, for our uh, outcomes? And we develop in each guideline an evaluation and monitoring grid that captures structure, process, and outcome indicators. We have now formalized those indicators to be part of a major uh, database system called Enquire, Nursing Quality Indicators for Reporting and Evaluation. Our spotlight organizations enter data into the Enquire database system related to the indicators for each of the guidelines they're implementing. So we are now amassing um, great amounts of data that our organizations look at to determine the impact of their work 
and that um, our Enquire team can uh, use to uh, focus on what is uh, the impact of implementing evidence-based guidelines. So I'll um, now uh, turn things, um, oh, well, I do have one more slide here about the goals of the program. And you can see that um, very much we're looking at reducing the variation in care as we're encouraging use of evidence-based interventions across systems. Also, guidelines become a way of transferring research evidence into practice and conveying the knowledge base of nursing. Of course, they assist with clinical decision making. And the work that we do helps us identify gaps in research, help practitioners stop interventions that have uh, little effect or, in fact, may cause harm. And then lastly, because evidence-based practice is cost-effective practice, we see that um, reducing cost is also a key goal of this program. I'm now going to turn things over to Grace Suva, who will give us uh, the uh, quick version of the guideline and what it entails. Good morning, everyone. So just to reiterate, the Primary Prevention of Childhood Obesity Second Edition is posted on the RNA website now, so it's free for download as well as for purchase for hard copy. Um, it was officially released during Nursing Week in May of this year. And in terms of the webinar series, Irma Jean had mentioned that the first uh, webinar, the launch for this guideline, took place June 25th. And uh, we had recently posted some resources on the website under the BBG um, with regard to the archived webinar, questions and answers to your, um, from the last uh, month's webinar, as well as our slide presentation. And we will also be posting this archived webinar for today on the same website as well. So quickly, the purpose and scope of the guideline is to, one, address the primary prevention of obesity in infants, preschool, and elementary school-aged children, so really focus on the earlier years, and to provide evidence-based nursing recommendations to all nurses and the interprofessional team across all practice settings. And specifically, there is a focus on population health, a look at the socio-environmental aspects of childhood obesity, as well as providing a health equity perspective to inform the recommendations. So as you see, there are three domains of recommendations. You have the practice recommendations, the education and organization and policy recommendations. And last month, we talked about um, key messages. So the first is that in comparison to the 2005 version of the BPG, uh, there's an emphasis on the social, environmental, and health equity perspectives, as I had said. So in addition to providing children and families with continued education and support with positive lifestyle changes, um, it is also imperative that nurses target environmental and societal factors that influence childhood obesity and get engaged in that way. So for example, getting involved in the development, promotion, and implementation of healthy public policies in order to positively influence uh, the food and physical activity environments and the built environments of children and their families and uh, take part in programs and initiatives to help to reduce poverty, because poverty has been shown to be related to childhood obesity. Second is that we focus on comprehensive approaches to childhood health. So this means that in collaboration with parents, schools, preschool centers, and other settings where children gather, uh, we focus on using multiple strategies, targeting behaviors, multiple behaviors, so eating, physical activity, screen time, and other sedentary behaviors, and providing these messages across various settings to positively influence children's weight and overall health. So for example, in schools, uh, it is ideal to incorporate these healthy weight strategies into a broader comprehensive school program that also includes a focus on growth and development as well as mental health. So as I said, this consistent messaging is important. Uh, lastly, um, the guideline emphasizes that the most effective primary prevention interventions target children in their earlier years because evidence shows that healthy habits are, are, are learned earlier in life and that these interventions are most effective um, according to the evidence in infants, preschool, and elementary school age children. And it is very important to get the engagement and uh, participation of parents um, or the primary caregivers 
in strategies that promote child health and prevent obesity, and those are key. So that's my quick overview, very quick overview of the last month's webinar. Now I'm going to turn it over to Heather to talk about BTSO. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have and join you here today. And um, I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about uh, the BTSO Best Practice Spotlight Organization Initiative as a critical uh, strategy for to support guideline implementation. And you can see from this slide, and it really reinforces what Emma Jean spoke about earlier in the session, that we have a multitude of implementation strategies we utilize to support the uptake of best practice guidelines. Some of them are at the individual level related to uh, specific strategies to support uh, practitioners and other, others in the clinical areas to support guideline implementation. Uh, some are at the system level where we're really focusing on trying to make change across a variety of um, organizations and uh, areas of focus. But this topic today is really focusing on a significant um, organizational level strategy or best practice spotlight organization designation. So the, the um, goals of this particular initiative are really to influence the uptake of best practice guidelines across healthcare organizations to enable practice excellence and positive client outcomes. And this is really um, a critical statement because we're wanting to ensure that all of the work we're doing with our evidence-based practice guideline development is being utilized across a range of sectors and in a range of organizations, um, but ultimately it's only um, to enhance clinical practice and to increase and ensure that the um, outcomes for clients are the very best that they can possibly be. So we've been doing this work since 2003, and the objectives for this program are really to establish a dynamic, long-term partnerships with these BPSO organizations um, by supporting knowledge-based nursing practice. We also want to be able to demonstrate greater strategies for successfully implementing best practice guidelines and learning from each other about some of the best ways to go about this. And certainly Laura is going to share with us today some of the strategies utilized at Toronto Public Health to support the uptake of this particular guideline we're focusing on today. Um, we're also wanting to really establish and utilize effective approaches to evaluate implementation activities. So not only the outcomes for patients and families, but also to really set, get a sense of what does it take to implement practice change within organizations. And then finally, to identify effective strategies for system-wide dissemination of guideline implementation. As Irma Jean indicated earlier, um, we certainly don't want our guidelines to sit on the shelf, but rather really want to focus on approaches to support their uptake um, at the point of care. So the, some of the structures that are in place to support the best practice spotlight organization, um, there is an application process and formal partnership with RNAO over a three-year period. So Toronto Public Health actually applied um, to participate and joined the BPSO initiative in 2009, and as Irma Jean indicated, we're designated three years later in 2012. During that period of time, they really focused on systematic guideline implementation using a planned uh, change approach which was based on the RNAO toolkit. Uh, they've established an infrastructure that really helps guide the work that they're doing, um, including reporting and monitoring the outcomes for their work. Reporting to RNAO, that was a critical element of our program. And in fact, on an annual basis, we meet with our BPSO um, prior to their designation twice a year to review written reports and discuss progress. And this is really an important element where we actually get to really talk to the organizations about how they're doing, what some of their strategies are, on what their successes are and where their challenges are. And this helps us all learn together um, to support practice change. Knowledge exchange is a critical component of this. So certainly the work that we do with the individual sites helps us to understand what they're ha happening locally. But knowledge exchange across all BPSOs really um, helps develop new strategies and new ideas within organizations. Sustainability planning starts right at the very beginning because of course on the long term we want this work to, be, to stick. And so Laura will talk a little bit about some of the strategies they've used to integrate um, the work that they're doing in childhood obesity within their organizational structures. And of course, as Irma Jean mentioned, measuring outcomes, the use of standard indicators. Once organizations have gone through the three-year period of preparation, they're designated as a best practice spotlight organization. And as a best practice spotlight organization, they're expected to sustain the use of guidelines to expand them to other areas of practice, to spread, and also to mentor other organizations who are coming into the program. 
So this slide just demonstrates the reach and the spread of these guidelines within different sectors. So since 2003 is when we started our work, we've had four cohorts of BGSOs. Um, and you can see from this slide that they represent long-term care, public health, acute care, primary care, home health care, rehab, and many other areas. We'll be starting our fifth cohort in um, April of 2015, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly. Um, one of the things I really want to emphasize is that this work is not only being done in Ontario, but in also in other parts of Canada and around the world. So you can see here that we actually have um, 73 BPSOs across um, internationally, including uh, BPSOs in Australia, South Africa, Spain, Chile, Colombia, the United States, and of course, the predominantly in Ontario. And all of us are learning from each other and the opportunity to network um, and share resources and strategies across the BPSO program has been really successful in supporting practice change locally and um, more broadly internationally. So I'm just going to share with you um, the BPSO requirements and you'll, you'll hear me talk about some of the very specific things that need to be um, done through the BPSO initiative, but basically they involve implementation, uh, capacity building, evaluation and research, dissemination, and sustainability. So we'll speak to first to implementation. Um, it is expected that organizations through this initiative are really focused on our clinical guidelines. And so we are asking BPSO organizations to implement a number of guidelines, some of which will be local, uh, maybe most appropriately implemented locally in one program or unit or area of practice, and others that will be implemented across the organization. So Toronto Public Health um, utilized one of the guidelines, Childhood Obesity, they implemented it organization-wide. Some of the other guidelines that they implemented included um, Enhancing Healthy Adolescent Development, which again was implemented across at Toronto Public Health, um, Postpartum Depression, Women Abuse, and Smoking Cessation. And now they're working on um, developing and sustaining nursing leadership, as well as establishing therapeutic relationships. So it's uh, the, this focus on implementation um, that will impact and touch every practitioner and every employee of the organization is critically important to this work. Um, one of the other things that we're really focusing on is capacity building and the opportunity to help staff at all levels of the organization gain the knowledge and skills necessary to support practice change and to lead implementation activities. And so much of this work is really focusing on building champions. Um, we mentioned the champions program a couple of times, but the champions are really um, individuals at various levels in the organization who can promote and support evidence-based practice, who have an understanding of some of the um, processes that need to be in place to help support practice change. And we're really looking at having a cohort of champions um, that are um, available within organizations to support each other. And I know Laura, um, within their program, at Toronto Public Health used the Champions model to help support the uptake of their obesity best practice guidelines. Um, another key element is the evaluation component. And certainly, although it's very challenging to look at the um, outcomes for childhood obesity in the short term, this is something that we absolutely need to be able to monitor over time. And so one of the things that um, the uh, Best Practice Spotlight Organization program has done is um, that we're actively participating in ENQUIRE. ENQUIRE stands for Nursing Quality Indicators for Reporting and Evaluation. And this really um, provides opportunity for the BPSO organization to collect and submit, submit data on quality indicators related to nursing practice, clinical client, uh, client clinical outcomes, and organizational structure uh, relevant to the guidelines that they've implemented. And so there's opportunities um, for the BPSOs to participate in this um, this initiative that will really help them gauge and monitor the successes that they're having in the area of implementation, be able to provide feedback to their staff in terms of um, how they're doing and areas that they will want to um, focus on more specifically in the future. Dissemination is another critical element of this work. Um, where these organizations working together are doing phenomenal things, um, both in their own organizations and sharing those successes with others. Um, so one of the things that we're really interested in throughout the BPSO initiative is opportunities for our best practice spotlight organizations to share broadly with the healthcare community the work that they're doing. 
And so certainly this involves such things as presentations. Um, Laura's here today with us to share their work with Platform of Public Health. So obviously a dissemination opportunity for her and her colleagues, but also we're expecting that BPSOs will submit uh, manuscripts for publication to have their um, work um, more broadly available to the healthcare community, um, as well as having a, a high level of um, a high level of uh, work related to um, the BPSO through their various dissemination channels, including their website. And this helps us ensure that the healthcare community is aware of the work that the BPSOs are doing um, and can really see the link between it and quality of care. And finally, um, sustainability is an area that is really important throughout the BPSO initiative and has become an element that we focus on right from the very beginning of working with our BPSOs. Um, once the BPSOs are designated um, after that three-year qualifying period, um, they are expected, as I said earlier, to really focus on the sustained practice change, being able to articulate what is it that we're expecting our staff to do differently in patient care, what practices look different now than they did when we started, and being able to monitor those practices to ensure sustained change is occurring, not only within the uh, practices of their clients, but also or their staff, but also for the outcomes for their clients. And so the sustainability elements is really um, something that we're learning more and more about as we've worked with organizations over the past um, 11 years, and uh, we'll continue to learn more about um, in, the, in the times to come. I do want to mention that there are some important timelines that I'd like to share with you. Um, cohort 5 is uh, going to be initiated uh, within the next uh, several months, and um, this is an exciting time for the RNAO and for a whole care organization who are interested in participating in this initiative. The release of the BPSO RFP for the 2015-2018 cohort will be released in the fall of 2014. Um, during the winter, we'll be looking at the proposal deadlines and submissions to the um, RFP will be expected over the course of the early winter, um, and the review process will take place during that time. We'll be identifying the uh, successful candidates um, during the winter of 2015 and anticipating the launch of the BPSO Cohort 5 um, in the new ministry fiscal year starting after April 1st, 2015. So you'll be able to hear more about that in the months to come. Um, because we will certainly be doing um, releasing when the RFP is released, we'll be having um, information sessions by webinar and that you can gain more information about the work uh, that's ongoing. However, at this time, I'd like to turn things over to um, Toronto Public Health and um, ask Laura Mitchell to, um, to uh, start us off on the next part of our session. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, today I'm going to share with you how TPH implemented and evaluated a screen time reduction initiative uh, in order to support the primary prevention of childhood obesity best practice guideline, um, as well as our BPSO experience. And this was based on the first edition of the guideline. Um, so I will be providing you with some background information as to how the screen time reduction initiative began the purpose, how we did it, what it looked like, um, the findings from our evaluation, some of the challenges and successes that we encountered along the way, and where we are headed with this. Okay. So when we began, the primary prevention of childhood obesity uh, nursing best practice guidelines were reviewed, uh, and it was quite evident that the services and programs at TPH already covered many of the recommendations. However, we did identify a gap, and that was with recommendation nine, um, in that first edition, it, it suggests that nurses promote a decrease in sedentary activities with emphasis on reducing the amount of time clients spend watching TV, playing video games, and engaging in recreational computer use. So our focus was on the development and implementation of initiatives to reduce screen time consumption. And since uh, consumption of screen time and obesity is occurring at such an earlier age in children, we decided to direct our initial prevention efforts at the preschool age population. Um, and this also provided us with an optimal opportunity within our organi organization to work um, collaboratively uh, with another directorate here 
Uh, so I'm in the Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention Directorate, and we work with um, school age and youth populations as well as adults. Whereas our Healthy Families Directorate, their programs and services are directed to parents and caregivers of children zero to six. So this was a great opportunity uh, for us to come together um, to address this guideline. Um, so a review of the literature about screen time reduction interventions for preschool children was conducted, and very few existed for this population. Um, and there was little evidence to support using any type of pre-existing intervention that was out there. So this was another gap that we found, um, so another great opportunity for us. Um, and by being a BPSO, it meant that my colleague, Nancy Lucier, um, who was uh, at TPH at the time, uh, she was able to participate in an advanced clinical practice fellowship uh, to do project work related to this best practice guideline, um, to learn about best practices and possible interventions to implement uh, practice changes. So she completed a thorough review of the literature that was out there, um, including the effects of screen time on children, as well as recommendations for possible interventions. And this led to a screen time reduction intervention being developed specifically for parents of preschool children and piloted through an existing program that already is at Toronto Public Health. And I'll uh, expand on that further in a later slide. Okay. So this outlines some of the research on how screen time is thought to affect body weight. Uh, increased screen time may compete with time spent being active. It may lead to consumption of advertised foods that are seen on TV. Um, and when you're sitting watching TV, your hunger cues can go unnoticed, which can also lead to overeating. So it's absolutely critical to engage and support families early in uh, children's lifespan, um, as this is when their viewing habits and behaviors begin to develop. And parents and caregivers provide that first opportunity to create an environment that promotes healthy growth and development, uh, that can establish healthy habits, family routines, and will model positive behavior. Um, and I just want to make note here as well, the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology, they released sedentary uh, behavior guidelines just for the, a few years ago. Um, and specifically for the early years, there are some recommendations around screen time. Um, and those recommendations are that for children under the age of two, screen time is not recommended. And for children ages two to four, screen time should be limited to under one hour or day, sorry, limited to one hour a day, but less is better. Um, but much of the research does point to the fact that many uh, preschool age children are engaged um, in um, much more screen time than the recommendations um, lay, uh, say. So moving on, um, the health action process approach, or the HAPA theory, was chosen to guide the development of our screen time intervention. And I'll just quickly go over this. Um, there's two distinct phases in this um, model, the motivational phase and the volitional phase. And so the focus of our screen time reduction initiative was on supporting parents and caregivers in the motivational phase which is the precursor to a behavioral intention or a goal. And there are three variables involved, um, which are on the left-hand side of your screen. And our intervention focused on measuring two of these variables, which are circled in blue, action self-efficacy and outcome expectancy. Um, so people need to become motivated before they can change their habits. And in order for parents to set goals for decreasing their family screen time, they need skills, information for changing their screen time. They need confidence in their ability to decrease screen time, which is action self-efficacy, and experience or expect to experience some type of reward. So that would be um, the outcome expectancy. And so once they have that intention to change their behavior, they enter the volitional phase, uh, which is the processes that lead to the actual health behavior. Um, so as a BPSO, we also had the opportunity to work with a program evaluator, um, and she was specifically hired to support with evaluating the implementation of the BPGs at Toronto Public Health. Um, and her ex expertise was extremely beneficial in this process. Um, so the purpose of our evaluation uh, was to determine if a screen time reduction initiative was feasible in terms of integrating it into an existing program and expanding it to other parenting programs across the city of Toronto. We also wanted to see if it would impact parent attitudes towards decreasing their child's screen time behaviors, uh, so looking at self-efficacy and outcome expectancies, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And will it impact uh, children's screen time behaviors as reported by their parents? Right. Um, so what did we do? We, uh, we integrated screen time reduction and awareness activities 
into a Nobody's Perfect parenting program. So for those of you that are not familiar with Nobody's Perfect, it's a free uh, eight to 10 week parenting education and support program. And it was developed by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, the program uses a participant-centered approach. Therefore, uh, the topics are designed to be flexible and meet the needs and interests of the specific group. And it takes a no-blame approach. It's more of um, an empowerment strategy. Uh, parents come up with solutions themselves and they're essentially provided with a forum to share and discuss strategies to change their own behaviors. Um, so this was a great fit. Um, and as I mentioned, we were working collaboratively with the other directorates, and this was the program that they identified would be a great fit to integrate screen time activities. Um, so we worked with them and designed activities that were incorporated into each of the existing topics. And you can see on the screen, this is a series of books in which um, the program is based upon parents, body, safety, behavior, mind. There's also a feelings book. and um, the, uh, the activities were integrated right into the topics within these books. Um, so the parents themselves were able to discuss the challenges and benefits of screen time, as well as potential strategies to overcome some of the barriers to reducing screen time. And I'll just give you an example. Um, so for the session that focused on the body book, um, the facilitators um, facilitated discussions on the relationship between physical activity in the body and screen time in the body. Um, and for the behavior book, there was discussion around uh, what do you notice when your child is in front of the screen for an hour versus what do you notice um, when they are um, being active for an hour. So it really gave that opportunity to discuss um, screen time and how it affects them and what type of strategies could they try at home. Okay, so we developed some measurement tools um, in order to uh, effectively measure if our um, intervention would be successful. And this one that you're seeing here is um, a self-report um, log. So at weeks one, four, and eight, uh, the clients were asked to um, complete this log, um, and we measured to see if they were successful in reducing their screen time. You will notice um, in, uh, I guess, the first line, it says 90 minutes or more is one of the options, and we learned later on that many of the clients reported that they decreased their screen time. However, they are still circling that 90 minutes or more. So we did notice that that may have impacted a bit on the evaluation outcome. So it's something to consider um, for implementation in the future. Okay. Um, this was the self-efficacy and outcome expectancy questionnaire that was developed, and um, clients completed this at weeks one and eight. Um, in the upper half, the questions asked about their confidence level in de decreasing screen time across various situations. Um, and in the bottom set of questions, um, they were asked um, if they believed positive or negative outcomes would occur. So in total, we did four Nobody's Perfect program pilots, um, and they took place between January 2012 and January 2013. Um, very diverse populations, mixed income. Two of the groups were actually done in Tamil, um, so our uh, resources were not translated. However, the facilitators uh, facilitated everything in Tamil and interpreted for them. 69% uh, of the sessions included a screen time activity, which we thought was uh, sufficient. Um, the, there was a bit of a variation. Some of the sessions were seven weeks, some were nine, and the first session was always dedicated to um, filling out the consent forms and, um, and filling out the first set of log sheets. Um, so here are some of our evaluation results. 45% um, reported a decrease in their child's screen time at the end um, of the uh, program, uh, whereas 51% expre expressed an increase in self-efficacy. Um, I also want to note for this one that there was also a reported 35% decrease in self-efficacy. Um, and in terms of outcome expectations, there were small but positive improvements as well. And in terms of the feasibility of um, running this initiative, uh, the facilitator said the screen time activities seem to blend in naturally with the topics and discussions already in the Nobis Perfect program. And in some cases, the discussions just came naturally and prompt. Uh, facilitators took that opportunity to expand on those um, sessions. Overall, the evaluation has been very positive. Um, and I meant to mention on the last slide, in, uh, between all four pilots, we had 44 participants, um, but there were 13 cases where one score was missing. So very small, um, very small pilot. 
at the end of the um, pilots, I, I did conduct a focus group with the evaluator um, with some of the facilitators of the program, and they really um, um, mentioned that each Nobody's Perfect program is different. Each session they had was completely different from another, and it builds on what parents already know and do for themselves. So the flexibility within the program and the ability to adapt the activities based on the needs of the, the group that they're working with really facilitated the success of this program. And also having um, the opportunity to work with another directorate um, in order to, uh, it, it facilitated the success of this as well. Um, and they also noted many of the positive um, attitude, parent attitudes that they observed and, um, and the positive verbal, um, uh, the parents verbally reported positive changes and intent to change, and that was um, happened throughout all of the sessions. Okay. So right here, these are just a few clips that were captured um, as I, I debriefed after each uh, session went um, with uh, the facilitators, and we captured some qualitative data, and I um, made sure that they did a screen time activity, or if they didn't, um, why, and so I captured all that information after each session. Um, but some of these uh, little clippets of information came up, and the public health nurses and facilitators were really excited because they really noticed some aha moments that the parents were having, um, and and it it just made uh, the conversation um, that much more richer and need more opportunities to expand in some areas. For example, I use TV because I don't know how to play with my child. So there was really opportunity um, to discuss further about that. So after the evaluation, um, there were a summary of recommendations um, that came from it. And one of them was to sample a larger number of participants and potentially use um, control groups. So a comparison could be made. Um, undertake a more detailed consideration of the validity of the self-efficacy items that were used in evaluation, um, potentially hold focus groups with the parents to get their insights um, after the intervention, um, translate materials, and um, we know firsthand that there was some difficulties there. Um, some key words such as the word uh, confidence was a very hard word to translate, and that came across in some of the questionnaires. Also standardized training for all facilitators. So challenges and successes, uh, there were many. <laughs> um, and one of the challenges was fitting it in with an already established program. Um, the key was to ensure that we worked with the Nobody Perfect uh, Public Health Nurses in the Healthy Families Directorate to create the activities and develop a program that would complement the books and the existing act activities. And the collaboration between both of our directorates at that point, it was very key to this process. Now, it was a challenge, but it was also um, a tremendous success. Um, there was, we also had to ensure that our measurement tools were low literacy and representative of our populations at Toronto Public Health, and also the challenges of working in a community. Um, some of the pilots didn't finish, and you'll notice that we did four pilots between January 2012 and 2013, and we originally thought we could do them all between January and March of the same year, um, but um, there were some things that came up. It wasn't a good fit for some of the pilots that we started. Um, so. We just um, went with it <laughs> and we implemented it into um, the sessions where it was a good fit. Uh, in terms of um, the successes, again, as I mentioned, working collaboratively with the other directorate and developing an initiative that, um, that can be integrated into something that we are already doing. Um, that was a huge success for us and being able to achieve some positive evaluation outcomes from that. Um, and also we were able to address um, a gap in the research and um, this has been, uh, many have uh, expressed interest in this initiative because there is not a lot of research in this area, screen time interventions for preschool age children. Um, also the leadership opportunities that we have been provided with throughout this whole experience has been very positive um, for myself, but for the colleagues that I have worked with that have been championing these pilots. Um, and we've also been exposed to various opportunities for knowledge exchange, such as this webinar. Um, we've had internal conferences um, at Toronto Public Health to share this information. We've had external conferences at provincial, national, and international levels. Um, and so it's really gotten a lot of attention and um, we're really trying to disseminate um, this information. Um, as I mentioned, there was not a lot of research in this area, so um, it's, uh, 
a lot of people are interested in it. Um, best strategy, um, what, our intervention was done in a very circumscribed manner at an individual level, and it was necessary for our project. So this is just a very small piece, and we're still learning what the best strategy is to address um, screen time. But we know the influences on individuals are at various levels, government, community, schools. Uh, so a coordinated effort at every level uh, is necessary for meaningful and successful outcomes. So in terms of where uh, we are going now and what we're doing right now, um, we are expanding to other parenting programs in the sense that we have, so far we have a group that has come together um, between the two directorates, and they're creating some grab and go activities, um, incorporating um, screen time, physical activity um, into, um, uh, and making activities that they can do with their parenting programs. So that is in the works. Um, also, the Healthy Families um, Directorate is looking into next steps with regards to this Nobody's Perfect um, pilot. Um, so um, after the recommendations were made, um, they're interested in making some of those changes and potentially um, seeing if they can do a pilot as well. Um, and then uh, at the school age population, there's a new pilot project that is underway. Um, and it's, uh, it's focused on childhood obesity prevention, and it's a multi-component approach. And I just have a few minutes to touch on this one, so I will, uh, let me just advance the next slide here. Um, so this is the Into Kids Health pilot project. Um, in 2012 at Toronto Public Health, we completed an evidence-based review to identify effective interventions for preventing obesity in school-aged children. And this led to establishing a pilot project with two of our main school boards here in Toronto, um, where we would implement recommendations from our review. Um, and I'll just give you some of the select recommendations that came from the review, um, targeting all children, schools in lower socioeconomic neighborhoods, environmental or uh, policy-based interventions, physical activity-based interventions that decrease sedentary behaviors, um, using a multi-risk approach, so combining physical activity and dietary-based interventions, um, and incorporating a multi-component approach, uh, including behavioral, environmental, and educational components. And this is what um, Heather had was discussing previously. Um, and in these recommendations, there's lots of what we already know, and it provided an opportunity to review if recommendations are being implemented, and if not, it identified gaps and opportunities. And our review um, was also consistent with recommendations from the Healthy Kids Strategy, uh, which was released in March 2013. Um, so the goal of this pilot project is to develop, implement, and evaluate a multi-component obesity prevention pilot intervention focused on healthy eating, physical activity, and mental well-being for elementary schools in two of our service delivery areas within Toronto. Um, and just quickly, a summary of kind of where we are at with this process. I'm actually involved in this pilot. Um, there are 10 pilot schools involved, um, five in the east end of um, Toronto, and then five in um, the northwest area of Toronto. So there's one public health nurse working with um, each of these five schools. Usually in our role, we have about 25 schools. So this is more intense support. Um, and this year, um, we really uh, focused on developing um, a comprehensive interview guide to do an in-depth needs assessment of the school community, not just within the school, but the um, broader school community as well. Um, and just uh, between April and June, we were um, developing action plans with our schools based upon um, the findings and the evaluations. Um, and these action plans looked at the home, school, and broader community environment. Um, so these are things that they really focused on when um, creating um, action items for their plans. And these are still in development, and um, we will continue to finalize them next year. And that's when implementation will begin. And um, an ev evaluation plan has also been developed, so each school board is completing um, their ethics review at this time. Great. And lastly, um, we initiated, initiated our school-based pilot from the recommendations of the evidence-based review um, that we had completed in 2012 that I just mentioned. Um, but now that the RNA has recently released second edition of best practice guidelines on primary prevention of childhood obesity has been released, we are fine-tuning our pilot project and other programs to align with this second edition, um, although for the most part, there is um, consistency. Great, and so thank you. And I'm going to turn this back over. Thank you very much, Laura. That was an extremely uh, 
helpful presentation, and it's um, wonderful to see how you went from uh, this focus on screen time and really to a much more comprehensive program that uh, looks like it's uh, going to be having system-wide impact. It is now our time for questions, and we already have two questions. We're open to take any more questions that you have. The first question um, is one about the BPSO program, and the question is, how successful is the BPSO program in supporting implementation of guidelines? Well, I think you can see from the example that Laura has shared uh, that um, certainly in Toronto Public Health, uh, there was great success with this guideline that uh, permeated both nursing uh, practice and the practice of many healthcare professionals with a, a wide impact. We find from all of our spotlights through their evaluation data that this approach does result in creating an evidence-based practice culture, does result in practice change that is sustained. And with the ongoing designation like an accreditation program, organizations do continue to sustain their work and expand it. I would uh, also mention that the Health Council of Canada, former Health Council of Canada, identified uh, the RNAO BPSO program as one of the most successful knowledge transfer strategies in healthcare. And I think you all are aware of uh, the challenges in healthcare taking anywhere from uh, eight to 12 years to bring about change based on best evidence. So um, this program is, um, is making a difference. I'll move to the second question. The question is um, this. Uh, I'm working in healthcare at the system level, government, in the field of chronic disease prevention and management. What can I do to support the dissemination of the guidelines or one particular recommendation? Now, I can start with some comments and return it to my colleagues, um, but basically you should be aware that all of the RNAO guidelines are freely available on the RNAO website, and we do have that site on a slide, and uh, they're freely downloadable. So one thing is absolutely to make uh, individuals aware of this. Uh, the evidence is uh, clearly uh, visible in the guideline and linked to each recommendation. Secondly, I would suggest uh, linkages to this uh, uh, webinar. All our webinars are archived, and um, information about the guideline is um, uh, on the webinar. Thirdly, I think um, it may be important um, to identify the key area or issue, i.e. childhood obesity, if this is the area you're looking at, and um, identify the recommendation with the evidence and um, provide uh, in a memo. Fourthly, and this might involve funding, um, there may be opportunities to pilot uh, implementation of specific recommendations that could be used and raise awareness among uh, key target groups of the importance of implementation of a specific recommendation. And lastly, what we hope our policy and decision makers uh, do with the guidelines is uh, engage in the policy development process uh, to create policy because the evidence is there and um, it uh, really becomes a uh, quicker process uh, given um, the data that's already there. So I'm hoping those uh, help. I don't know if um, Heather or others have other comments. Okay, we're, we're getting questions fast and furious. Um, can BPSO be implemented in piecemeal? Uh, some program areas may not have direct client impact, i.e. immunization. Would love to have some research to advocate in my organization. I'm not exactly sure if you mean BPSO or BPG. 
what we, I'll take it that you mean BPG, and what we look at uh, generally uh, in BPGs is organizations should really look at the recommendations and do what we call a gap analysis to see what of the recommendations are they currently implementing, what could they implement that they're not and that they should work on, and what doesn't fit the context. So if there are areas that don't fit the context, it's absolutely um, quite uh, appropriate that you not carry out that recommendation. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the BPG does include the research. All of the references are available for more in-depth um, uh, review. Uh, I think this question is um, for you, Laura. Um, it says, we do triple P parenting program in Thunder Bay. Do you think that the activities that you added to your program would apply to other parenting programs? So, Laura, I wonder if you would um, answer that question. Yep, um, so I'm not too familiar with the triple P parenting program, um, but I don't see why not that um, screen time uh, reduction messages couldn't be integrated into other parenting programs um, like we're doing here at Toronto Public Health. Uh, I also want to mention that we do have uh, a report that was written, so if um, anyone is interested in more information, um, I am able to send that electronically. Okay, and so Laura, maybe just to coordinate things, if you send that here, we can send it out to anyone who might be interested. Absolutely. Okay, I have a another question. Um, how many guidelines, I think it's how many recommendations of the obesity BPG is Toronto Public Health currently working on? Laura? Um, yes, so for the current pilot project, I'm not sure of the exact number. Um, however, we are addressing many of them through all, all of our programming and services that we already do. Um, and, and that was what happened when we reviewed the first um, set of guidelines. And that's when we identified that one gap because a lot of the services that we do provide in chronic disease and injury prevention, um, our goal is to reduce childhood obesity. Um, and so many of the recommendations are addressed. Okay, and Laura, there's two more questions for you, and I'll read them both. Um, one is, um, how are the unintended consequences addressed in the pilot related to uh, school-age children? And then the second question is, St. Elizabeth was listed as a support organization. What is their role in this incentive? Okay, so can you, can you repeat the first question? The first question was, how were the unintended consequences addressed in the pilot related to school-aged children? How are the unintended effects of, uh, consequences um, to address um, in school age? How were um, they addressed? How were they addressed? Well, we are still um, in the process of piloting this, um, this new pilot. This just began this year. But we're choosing interventions to limit these um, unaffect, um, unintended consequences as we're planning it. Okay. And then the second question was, St. Elizabeth, what was their role in the initiative? Uh, St. Elizabeth's role in this initiative? Um, I do not believe that there was a role with St. Elizabeth in the Screen Time Reduction Initiative. Okay, okay. Someone said they were listed as a support organization. Oh, oh, I see. You mean as an organization, uh, St. Elizabeth Healthcare is um, a spotlight organization, and it was one of our first spotlights that came on board in 2003. So they are a long-term spotlight organization implementing numerous guidelines in home health care. I hope that answers the question, and then I'll just turn, we have about one minute, I'll turn to uh, Grace. There was a question that related to um, Enquire indicators. 
Uh, so the inquiry indicators are currently in um, progress of being developed by our research team here. Uh, but there are evaluation and monitoring um, indicators in the guideline, I believe around page 70 or so. So um, it's still in progress, but uh, we will let you know as soon as uh, they're developed and they're out. Thank you. Okay. Um, we do have one quick question. It, it is for you, Laura, again. How does the Toronto Public Health Research and Schools complement or add to what we already know about comprehensive school health? Um, well, it kind of it aligns with um, what we already um, do in school health. Um, I, I think this question might be better answered for the lead of this project, um, which I can definitely connect you with um, afterward as well. Okay. Well, that's great. And it sounds certainly from what you've said that it quite aligns. Um, and if it doesn't, it should because this oh, is does, what we're all talking about comprehensive school health should yeah. include. With that question, I do want to at this point uh, thank you all for being involved, all our speakers, Grace and Heather and you, Laura. And um, also uh, draw your attention to the slides. Um, reinforcing our next webinar will be September the 8th from 12 to 1, and um, we'll talk about adapting the primary prevention of childhood obesity guidelines in different clinical settings, and that really does link with one of the questions that was asked. Um, and uh, you can download the implementation toolkit from that site that's on the slide, which will help you with the steps to implementation. And then just moving on, uh, details about the BPSO program presented by Heather. That's the website for that, um, www.rnao.ca slash bpg slash bpso. And then uh, next to access the guideline, you can see the site for that. And then if you wish a hard copy, um, there is a... Um, link to how you can order a hard copy. Uh, anything off the website is freely downloadable. There is a cost for the hard copy to cover production and mailing costs. And then lastly, for more information about this um, webinar and uh, other webinars related, please contact Laura Sykes and her email is there. And there is an evaluation at the end of the presentation. We'd love to hear from you because we continue to shape and develop our webinars based on your input. And uh, Laura will let you know uh, the link um, um, after the evaluation. You will be directed to the link so that uh, there can be um, archive. You can access the archive the material. So thank you all, and uh, we hope to see many of you back uh, September the 8th as we continue our webinar series. And I should alert you to uh, the fact that this is the last session coming up on the obesity guideline, and we will commence later in the fall with um, webinars focused on um, prevention of abuse and neglect of older persons. So thank you all and have a great rest of the day. Good day. I'm not sure if I was supposed to just exit without going to say thanks.